Welcome to another one of our design lectures here for JSAO. And it is my distinct honor to bring to the stage Lieutenant Colonel Matthew Primu. Did I say that right? Yeah, Matt? that's fine. It's, it's, he's French Canadian, so uh, his, his uh, background is really exceptional. This is why it's exciting to have uh, the quality of international design experts come down to JSAO to not only help us with faculty, as, as Matt is doing this week here at an advanced course, uh, but also bringing in his unique perspective, in this case on systemic operational design, uh, the Israeli style, but, but with his own nuances and modifications and what is going on at the Canadian Forces College. So Matthew is a combat engineer. He's an Afghan uh, veteran from ISAF, and he also has been to the U.S. Army School of Advanced Military Studies. So he's a recovering planner, just like me. And uh, he's also faculty at the Canadian Forces College, where he's been doing the shifting sands design exercise and all of their comprehensive education uh, for the past few years. So he's got some unique insights on design applications in terms of theory, practice, and education. So without further ado, Matthew, thank you for coming. Thanks, man. Hi, everyone. I think I'll start something very Canadian. I apologize for my voice. Uh, it's a bit rough this morning. Um, so I think as we're growing old, most of us here are kind of, you know, gaining, gaining years in experience. There's moments we can think back in our life and find it's very defining in what we've become today. You know, it could be the birth of your child, which made you a very different person. What motivated to join the military in the first place? I think in our generation, it's not 9-11. And as you know, young, a lot of our troops, that is the defining moment. I've got one of those defining moments uh, in my life. And essentially, I'm sitting in a beach in Tel Aviv in March, pondering about one of the hardest questions I had in my life. Um, and it's funny from a Canadian perspective, because you know, in Tel Aviv in March, you can imagine the beach is actually pretty empty. Uh, it's not that warm. So I love that you know, I was finding it extremely balmy with my wool sweater. So now, what's interesting is not so much the beach, but um, what I was pondering about then and why it became a defining moment. So essentially, I'm a student at Sam's, and I've got this, we do a monograph, and I got this wonderful monograph directive. Her name is Dr. Alice Butler-Smith, which she, she's influenced countless amounts of us uh, designers across the world. Ben is one of them. And uh, so she's really suggested that I go in Israel as part of my inquiry into my monograph. And essentially, I went to Israel. She hooked me up with some of the greatest minds of the country, controversial figures, people who had different perspectives. What I love about Israel and why it, it was so wonderful, that trip, is because in Israel and Palestine, you can feel complexity. You, you literally see it. You, you, and it's like walking into a systems mapping. You see the opposition and the tensions between people's identity from being Jewish, Israeli, new generation, old generation, Palestinian. What does it mean to be Palestinian? And of course, those identities are fluid, but there you really, really find and feel that dynamic. Also, the dynamic of the exterior, the world, the U.S. opinion, what's in the media, and all those conflicting narratives, which are so key to the Middle East and especially to that area of the world. And you really feel it, especially in Tel Aviv. Um, so I was, I was quite amazed at how clear and useful it was for me to conceptualize con complex problems and complex systems. And so I'm on that beach, back to the beach. I'm texting uh, Dr. Butler-Smith. I'm saying, this is wonderful. I'm, I'm getting to understand all this complexity. I had some reflection on it. And she replied back quite quickly. And uh, I forget exactly what she replied back. Fortunately, I changed on. But it was essentially five words. Why? Why do you see this? Why does it matter? What can you do with it? I don't know. But essentially, it led me to that three hour and a half pondering, which really launched me into design to something that I'll share with you that might sound very superficial in words, but to me was completely paradigm changing in the way I look at the world. And essentially the realization I had then is that our understanding of the world, or the world reveals itself in function of a method of questioning. And I was hooked. This is the beginning of my passion for design. And ever since I've really, really embraced that idea that although you can have those wonderful classes and teaching and and JSAO is at the leading edge of design in the world, I am telling you from my experience, you still have to internalize that dream. You still have to do it a lot yourself. So I went and I did a bunch of things, took chances a lot at Toronto or King and Forces College. It's very welcoming for folks like me to take chances and go and try to do design. I had successes, 
fell forward, as we said yesterday, a few times. Even now, more ambitious, you fall again, but you learn from it. And you really go into this, uh, uh, this mindset. So this is what I'm going to share to you today. I'm going to talk about um, how I distill design, what design means for me as a facilitator, as one who is designing design. So more this piece. And this is kind of the metaphor I'm going to get you today. So I'm going to go four steps today. The first, I want to bring a bit more context. This is it. Then we're going to go into, I, I, design, I divide design in two steps, two portions, no steps, portions. One is the design inquiry. Okay? One is how we look at what we have and the problem. <laughs> Risky word, but you get what I'm talking about. Look at alternate states, bridge the two, and find ways, operationalized ways, to have the effect you want to change the system. The design inquiry, right? Like ADM and all those methods we look. That's part one. Part two, I'm going to look into design heuristics, the play, the aspects that you're doing, doing a lot today to play with knowledge, play with information, play with what you know in your brain with others, and really gain that shared understanding while reframing. And the last part of my presentation, I'm going to bring it back to the metaphor, why this is important, and kind of give a few soats of things that might be useful for you uh, from my experiences and my observations doing and watching a great designer. Uh, from around the world do their stuff. So context, um, this is from Paul Virilio, which uh, if you work with Dr. Alice Butler-Smith, it's a must. Um, it's essentially a great philosopher who try to simplify as much as possible what's going on in the world right now. And this is not globalization, you know, Lexus and Olive Tree style. This is not that type of everything is interconnected, the butterfly effect. This is how I personally distill down the most essential driver of why we need design and the most essential driver that how I do design. Design is all about speed and speed becomes your risk. So not only as you know in the world, things are accelerating in terms of how information and a fact somewhere can have a strategic effect elsewhere by straight Twitter world, media world, or just reality of interconnectedness driven by technology, those many things you know, I don't want to but essentially what drives, that's my frame when I do design, I'm very cognizant of it. One other aspect of this, uh, just to reemphasize, is I have found that because of this speed concept, the urgent is becoming the important a lot. And that's also a thing that motivates design to be more thoughtful, deliberate, and creative, as opposed to always firefight the urgent, thinking that it's important. All right, so part one, the design inquiry. I personally have had the chance to look at uh, many methods. I'm no expert in none. I would not say I'm an expert in SOD, for example, although I love it and I'm trying to explore it. And I had the chance to do it with Afra uh, once or twice, and it was a wonderful experience. So it is kind of my favorite method. But in looking at the ADM and looking at all of them, I tried to distill the essential of the design inquiry. And to me, the essentials are these. They're not steps, OK? They're components. So first one on the board is an appreciation for change. So if you're looking at something, at a system that constitutes your current reality, or how you perceive your current reality, and you don't find anything that needs changing, anything that is a problem, or more useful, anything that is against your values, because a lot of design is value-based when you distill it down, as you know, then is it worth doing design itself? Or are you trying to find a problem to a solution. And that's the key step that cannot be overlooked. Um, step, again, a key portion that has to be overlooked, generally at the beginning of an inquiry. Because if you don't do it there, later on as you're going to the inquiry, you realize that your efforts are futile, you've wasted resources, lost credibility. So it's an important portion of every design inquiry is be careful. Um, if there is some really something that you want to change or needs to change or is a problem or a change in your system itself, and then you investigate it. Okay? So another key element is an appreciation of a preferred state, or more appropriately, preferred states. So you're within a system. If you're feeling, if, you, if it goes against your value, if you can see that there's a tension, that something is wrong with it, then clearly, de facto, somewhere out there in the cognitive space, there's a preferred alternative. There's an alternate space that you want to go. You need to characterize that. You need to describe that. Otherwise, you're just a self-licking ice cream cone. 
still in your design inquiry, and you can do all the heuristics you want, you're not going somewhere anyway. That's an important component, and it's in the ADM and it's an SOD, just built differently. Um, third one is an appreciation for what is preventing you from achieving the preferred state or preferred states. I prefer preferred states, right? Multiple futures, and they can build on each other or be dismissed as you go. That's great. It's part of the creative process of having things you can dismiss in the iteration. So this is quite important as well. But here's, if you were to stop at this or just do this, let's say we take climate change. So my current state of climate change, Australia is burning. Clearly is something going on, right? Something needs to change. I've looked at this superficially. So an appreciation of a preferred state, preferred states, while I'd like my daughter who's eight when she's 28 and has the ability to go and travel and live our wonderful ecology in Canada and lakes and everywhere in the world, which I've had the chance to explore a lot, rock climbing, hiking, so on. I want her to have that opportunity. That's my preferred state based on my values. My values is opportunity for my daughter. Nothing beats that, as any father would know. So if I went to this third one and I stopped there, I'd say, well, what's preventing us? Well, is it pollution for cars or all these carbohydrates or oil electricity? Or is it overpopulation? Now, if I stuck to that narrative, well, if it's overpopulation, why don't we let a bunch of people die? You know, and you know some of the crisis we're having right now in some places of the world when it comes to viruses, and cognizant we're filming, so out of context in a few years, it might not be useful. But should we just let a common uh, flu virus or something just expand? Oh, let's just get them there and all die, and, and maybe us, but at least we won't have climate change. Of course not. It goes against some other of our values, humanity, caring about people, and step four. All right, it's all right to know the delta between your current and your preferred state, but what's your rival? What's, what do you really want to change? What can you change? Feasibility starts kicking in there because design doesn't happen in the world that there's no resources or constraints or money. I mean, this is, this is the real world we're talking about. So now you're looking at what you can change and this is how you start operationalizing, creating a narrative, creating a transition that goes into um, operational action. So in a nutshell, that's the design inquiry for me in the most simplest way I could find so far. Um, so this is SOD. SOD is many things, folks. You saw great references from Ben. You saw um, great videos from Offer. I recommend you do more. So SOD has its challenges as you look. First off, it's because of the way it was created. Some of the language can be quite opaque, opaque to us. And it's not just a magic matter of the terminology, but also it comes in the Hebrew culture. Something beautiful we were talking about yesterday in the Hebrew culture is how they love to have, it's actually part of their traditions, to have very strong oral arguments to try to build and debuild an idea. It's something that's quite common in religious uh, portions of the uh, Hebrew speaking world, I'll say it that way. And therefore, there's inner tensions within this Udi that makes it constructive if you're, if you're welcoming it as an opportunity to reframe it in your own terms and how you weigh. But I, you know, you could have maybe Afran and Shimon Neve doing it and me doing it. It's all different. But at the root of it, there's some commonality. And there is room for interpretation. That's the beauty of doing SOD with the wonderful low vibration, not only because she's super nice, but because you see how your intuition and your feeling is useful and works with SOD. So it's not as unreachable as a lot of you, I'm sure, think when you're trying to find the materials. And to me, this is very much the purest way of design. And here's why. So I try to build kind of a, you know, think of this as the electromagnetic spectrum. You're all probably familiar with this uh, somewhat, but the x-axis here is slightly different. So if we got those different design inquiry methodologies, on the left we got operational planning process, NATO uses the same term, US, the MTMP, and on the right we got SOD. There's a bunch, there's an evolution for me, and one of the key characteristics of this axis is the degrees of freedom. It's how different methodologies allow you to really go from the detail to abstraction and to reframing in a completely different domain and come back, which is extremely useful. You can then much more easily in systemic operational design completely go from one domain of thought to the other. In fact, uh, a lot of um, people from Israel especially uh, who like this method would argue that it's more relevant to know about ballet than it is to know about tactics in SOD. Because the metaphors can be extremely powerful. Okay? So it's a strength I really like because 
as someone who lives a life like just all of us, you realize that your intuition are empowered, your experience is empowered, the more degrees of freedom you have, and they can translate in a much more creative way. I am not naturally creative, folks. I have to you have methods to be creative. And I suspect a lot of you are that way. This is why I love this. As we move left, you know, I use the Canadian term business tools. This is where empathy kicks in for me. This axis is mostly for military people. I believe that we are essentially trained, not intentionally, but de facto, to be emotional virgins. Strong word, but it's not systematizing us to be empathy. We have to go and kill, close with and destroy the enemy as a foundation to what we do as military. And it's extremely difficult unless you've got some filters in you to be able to do this and prosecute it daily. But when you get to field grade level and you're trying to be creative and to have good design results, you need those tools to not be empathy. Maybe that's me, but I know I'm not a naturally empathetic person. I really am not. So I had to develop tools that way. And design is a great way to look at things from a different perspective. And there are methods. You've done a few here today. It's wonderful. As we move left, while well, the US Army, the, the methodology I'll talk in a minute in Operation Five. So let's go in, in ADM. So this is a slide I built four years ago, the day I graduated from SAMS. And I got to tell you, I think it's wrong as hell. I think it's the wrong thing. A lot of folks, me, and a lot of my peers who went to SAMS and did a lot of ADM believe that this is a good way to make it as a context. But more important is if you want to do the ADM, understand, ask. You got your expert here. Ask where it comes from, ADM, from an history debate with you. It's a wonderful design tool. I use it, but there's a context to use it that is really useful. And I can't, you know, of course, the ADM was designed for mass. We're training thousands of major every year or hundreds who are going to go and be dispersed and need to have the common language in a U.S. geographic component commander at the I operational level to be able to speak the same word and have a methodology to transfer their results or the design to the troops. Works well. Love it. But there's a context for it. Why I don't like this slide, yet I was embracing it a few, just a few years ago, it's because it, it's oversimplifying it to the point where it's deceiving. So, key thing that I don't like. It's suggesting that the ADM is only conceptual and that it's only divergent thinking. Well, real design is not that way. And we've discussed this week, in fact, that there's design and planning, and there's planning and design. And I'll come to that a tiny bit later. So it's not that at all. The ADM, you're trying to be divergent, but you've got this wonderful spiral of Convergence, divergence, convergence, divergence. And you also have this spiral of bottom, conceptual and detail. The details, the fact, inform the pattern, inform the deduction, the abstraction. And you can come back to new details who can serve you in your design inquiry. So this too is a spiral of knowledge. So this is really, really neat. And you probably will see this somewhere because I've used it and I wouldn't be surprised and other people think it's a great way to package it all nicely to make a nice slide but it is limiting. ADM is a great tool, but from history, it is what's meant to be packaged. Here you go. Here's your ADM, okay? So it's slightly limiting, less degrees of freedom. A great tool for a group. So, carry on on the, on the uh, design inquiry. I like this metaphor and I like to look at risk. Risk is a great way to elevate your discussion to more of a conceptual um, level. So I like this metaphor of a cruise ship for a design inquiry. So essentially, you're in a certain port. You come in for your design inquiry. Let's say this week you've done some, and you get in the ship. You got your resources. You got your team. You got your food. You got your things. Things are contained, and you're going, and you're looking at where you're going to go. And you know you've got a destination, but you're in the process, locked in the process. Right? It's comfortable, generally. I'm speaking. I want to look if you, if you connect with that description. It, generally, it is comfortable. It is made to be fun somewhat. You're playing with this. You don't feel huge risk very often when you do it in design inquiry, especially in the school environment. Um, so it's kind of a, a fun, comfortable feeling of safety. Um, but there's other characteristics. Very often in a design inquiry, you can be disconnected from the world. So there's pluses to that. Right? You can focus on what you're doing and keep your cognition going. Take the breaks you need to be more creative because it's important. Breaks are just as important as the work because the background, your second brain, as I'll simplify absolutely wrongly, 
it's kind of digesting uh, the superficial information. You know, and you're making synthesis without realizing it. Sleep is important, good foods, having friends, socialization. All that thing is key to design inquiry. And to me, it makes it feel a lot like a cruise ship. Um, and of course, there's, a, there's other risk. One of the other risks that we have, uh, you can hit an iceberg. You know that. You can come to a point where, well, either you're disrupted because something's happened to your cruise ship, everybody's sick, up to the obvious. But you can also hit something that really redirects. For example, if you haven't done your first step, and you realize that there's nothing to change in this system, well, you've hit your iceberg. Design inquiry is up. But it's still a good characterization. Or so I thought. I want to argue today that the cruise ship metaphor works in an academic environment. I don't know, but I suspect a lot of you identified perhaps this week with being in a cruise ship somewhat as you're doing uh, design. And a lot of time when I've used it at CFC, this is how I built it a feeling of safety to learn, and it's useful for learning and encourage you to do it. However, it's not reality. However, when I've done design inquiries, design work with the real military world, the, the cruise ship just goes off, uh, goes off you know, the flat side of the earth there, falls off a cliff somewhere, Niagara Falls. Doesn't work. It's not a right characterization of design inquiry. So if you look at that image, probably most of you have a clue who that is. Of course, it's Mao, right? So between 1934, in 1936, Mao went on the long march, 12,500 kilometers, went from 86,000 workers and peasants, which he considered his, his army, his forces, his group, to 7,000 remaining. Right? And every 72 hours on average, he was under contact from the enemy. There were air raids, you know, not in the 18th century, air raids on him. You know, they had so much information. So at that time, under that intense friction, an enemy, a reality, a challenge, is when he designed his campaign. He realizes his key element was the workers, the peasant, and he looked at his alternate futures. How can we actually gain this? And that's how he, he actually did it, much more in a guerrilla warfare sense. Right? So as I think you're, you're getting my drafts, is when you're doing design in reality with military people in your environment, defense, got to be careful, in Canada, defense is civilian military, so it's not just military, where we're certainly not. It's quite the diverse and uh, much more powerful for that you know, as part of the design inquiry. You, um, you really have the pressure. Your design sponsor will have immense pressure. I had one who's a designer, who has his entire team as a designer. We had a great way to do a seminar, and Cold Feet got caught them on the day before because they felt that the, the inquiry really, really had to answer their problem with their organizational challenge they had with uh, a certain challenge. And all of a sudden, he wanted to take hold of the design seminar on day one, first hour, and situate the estimate. Bang. Which, from a design point of view, is terrible. Right? He would have told me, what's his line of effort? What's his priority? And where he want to work? No, 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 that's not useful. Because you've killed the shared understanding. You've killed the buy-in. You've killed it's quite intuitive to all of us who are now versed with design. Because he was feeling the pressure. So as a design facilitator, you need to be aware of that and be able to negotiate that. It's quite challenging. And the monkey comes on your shoulder. To use an analogy of the 1979 article, it's quite famous. You not only own the design output at the end, but now you're owning selling design as a process. We've discussed that a bit this week, right? Because there's that friction in the design sponsor, but also the friction in the environment, right? It's dynamic. They expect you to come up with results. Some design inquiry can last six months, for example, and change. Well, what's the organizational path patience? to go through that process. And at one point, they'll just say, well, I want planning results. Where's your planning matrix and your works matrix? And I'm an engineer, so works matrix. And where's your this and your that and your dependencies and call and your Gantt chart. And, and you know, and you, you, Americans are wonderful with log logistics planning. Um, you know what I mean, right? They want to see results. So you have to deal with those pressures, although your design inquiry may lead to something that's not useful. So it's guerrilla warfare from a design inquiry point of view. Because you really have those frictions and those tensions all the time as you're trying to have your group devise ways to actually create desired futures at design. Um, let's go part two, design heuristics. So this is the play, right? And I won't expand on what the play is. And play, sometimes it's a misleading word because it can be quite frustrating and challenging to work with the different, the different perspective in the group. A group dynamics, in fact, is, is a key challenge. And I'll talk in a minute. So, but there's key characteristics in that, but as your designer, you need to be careful of, right? I've put a few on the board here. 
a few things that, that describe it, certainly. And of course, one of the biggest advantages that I need to emphasize, because it's often missed, is diversity in the group. You know, in Canada, we've been for years diverse in our communications plan, a communication strategy, emphasizing the value of diversity. But I still beg the question, are we that diverse? And you have in your design facilitation work, really question whether you're diverse enough. And do some social engineering, as in bringing in outliers, because it's really, really useful, as long as they're not sucking the oxygen of the entire group, you know, just on about their perspective the whole way. But this is really, really important. And we have a perspective sometimes that just because we got someone from the Navy and Air Force and the planner and logistician, that all of a sudden we got diversity. No, no. It doesn't work that way for most problems. We've got to be bold on it. Not only gender, if you look at institutional issues, but other things like that. So, of course, the key characteristics. And design heuristics, you know, to reemphasize what they are, they are so many things you can create your own. I think you got that. There's risk in getting stuck and, oh, but how did it look in a manual or a course I did? Wrong answer, wrong frame. Forget about it. How does it feel to you? Does it help you understand it? Is it visually relevant to how your brain conceptualizes that problem? It's a good question. There are hundreds of these tools. So don't think that the wonderful tools you've looked here are extensive or what you need to use. Go out there, read books. I can suggest you a bunch. Uh, there's tons. But of course, there's risk in design heuristics just like there's risk in the design requirement. So I like this metaphor for design heuristics of teleportation, where essentially at the root of it, you're trying to bring your group from one frame of idea, one conceptualization to another. another. Constantly kind of bounce back between frames, right? So that sounds quite interesting. In fact, you know, we could put teleportation on a huge cruise ship, you design an inquiry, and bounce from the dining hall to your room, to the gym, to Whatever club you want to do, I mean, some ships are big enough, it'd be worthwhile, uh, in my opinion, to some degree. So this is a, a metaphor I like uh, to express that. But there's risk. So one of the risks is group dynamics. I spoke a bit earlier. This is really tricky. But as a facilitator, you observe, 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 question. I'll challenge you to observe, 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 restructure if you need to. Change your people around during the design inquiry is something that is counterintuitive at times because you believe that you grow knowledge and you get more comfortable because you have norm, right? Storm, norm, conform kind of logic. It's not useful. It is counterproductive in the group. So you need to change your personnel. You also need to think about strategy to manage the group, those in the groups you'll observe that suck the oxygen. And I'm saying that very pejoratively, but I don't mean it that way. So some folks learn by talking or expressing themselves. If that's the case of the person who sucks the oxygen, try to direct that person to playful skills, Legos, drawing, by asking questions, only using Legos, only using the ideas, post-its, express your idea, poof. You have a neutral ground now for your entire group to have the chance to express their ideas, and by doing so, challenge the ideas of others. Okay? So you need to develop those strategies. That's the risk of design heuristics in your small group. Of course, there's tons of other risks. I think this group probably knows what this is, right? 1980s. So this is the movie to fly, use the name. Where essentially he's teleporting from one, is it? Yeah. <laughs> I just realized they were filmed. Hopefully he's not completely naked, that would be weird. <clears throat> so where you, um, he teleports. But at one point he's doing a, you know, if you can continue on a metaphor of teleportation, he teleports with a fly. And therefore his genes are mixed with the fly and progressively, he transforms into a fly. Well, the same thing exists as a risk in design heuristic, where you're going to go from design heuristic to another, keeping assumptions, keeping elements and thoughts that you haven't criticized enough through critical thinking. And now you're stuck with it and you're playing all the way, all the way to the end, unless you have mechanisms to rechallenge your thoughts. Okay? So this is a key risk of design heuristics that you need to be aware of, and as a facilitator, Always critical, okay, are they missing something? And we challenge them time given. Are they missing, is there a nail in their forehead they're not seeing, which is a common analogy in social work, um, that they need to see? And you don't tell them, because that's not heuristics. Heuristics is about how others learn, not how about you learn and telling others, it's not a lesson. So you gotta ask them the question to make them somewhat realize that maybe there's an issue. And that's really tricky, it's an art. But you got to do it as a facilitator because you got that's a huge risk in your design facilitation. Weird stuff. OK, 
contamination, that fly stays in, and you become, your, your design becomes a mix of human and fly that is dangerous and goes nowhere and dies at the end after eating a lot of sugar. Um, there's other, another one I like is a tin teleport, which I uh, love a metaphor for. Imagine that you're a 3D, you go in the machine, the teleport, and you end up 2D at the other end. Anyone, and anyway, in this metaphor, the point I'm trying to make is you might lose the core of your idea as you're going from heuristics to the other. And to me, the key thing is to balance your heuristics with your design inquiry. I believe I actually saw it today, where I saw a group who was getting stuck on heuristics and graphic and how to depict an idea they feel was mature, not knowing where they were trying to get with that idea. Are they looking at potential futures or current state or a delta or an alternative? Yeah. Where the hell are we? Pause is a failure and hasn't gone back. What are you trying to achieve here? Right? So if you've done that cruise ship properly or that guerrilla warfare, you can actually go back from the design heuristics. And that will avoid you that thin teleportation of going from 3D to 2D and, and losing some of the content. And of course, carry on in risks. I think this picture kind of speaks with itself. If, if you're heavy on design heuristics because that's what you know, I would argue that the business world and business contractors uh, that do business design only and not military, is a huge risk with that because they'll focus on the heuristics, not the inquiry, because it's easier to sell and it's less frustrating and they don't have to own the result of it. It's a bias that you'll see. So this is really important if you're hiring contractors to, from civilian work, from I don't want to name companies, of course, who come and do design. And you just got to be aware of it. They bring great strengths in empathy and human centered. They're wonderful. We do it all the time in Canada. I got my favorites and I adapt to who I think are better suited for what we're doing. But you be conditioned that if they do design heuristics after design heuristics, all of a sudden you almost become random in your talk. You moved away from your design inquiry and disasters happen. Okay? And disasters in civilian world is, well, here's my new phone boss. Well, I don't like it. Okay, I'll do another iteration. Wow. You know, and what, okay, you lost your contract, you find a new one? In the military, you all know that the impacts are defense. The impacts are huge, and they can be huge from the smallest of events. That little black swan, it happens actually all the time. You know, just think coronavirus right now, and now it's changing how we perceive a lot of our public safety, and how defense is linked with that in so many countries for quarantine purposes. Think of any event you thought you've seen over the last few months. Some of them are very narrow, and if you're use, just using design heuristics without a design inquiry, you really have the risk of going random of having such a disaster. So this picture. Is um, the first real instance where we have guerrilla warfare, or in French, I can't say guerrilla for the life of me properly anyway. So that's it, yeah. So this is Napoleon's troop in Spain. So it's 180. Somebody knows by art. 1808, right? French invasion of Spain. Of Spain is really when we see some of the core elements of guerrilla warfare start to happen, and Napoleon troops are literally bitten at the edge. You can imagine like a Swiss cheese and. They're bitten everywhere, and they, they lose uh, uh, lines of supply and so on. So that's where the, world, the word guerrilla warfare, or la petite guerre, French perspective, comes from. So from what we've seen, just to kind of summarize a bit the two steps, in a design inquiry process, in a school, it might feel very much like a cruise ship. In a learning environment, that is probably the best way to make it feel, so that people feel more comfortable, at ease, resource, cut away from the world to go to result. But it is not the reality you will have when you do design in your teams and the real output. Be cognition of that and prepare in advance, and I'll give a few tricks. Second is in the design heuristics. It's fun as hell. I love, and I think Jay Sow is an expert in this. I absolutely love those tricks, those, those, um, those ways to reframe ideas and challenge perceptions. And I, they're wonderful, and they set the stage for so many things. However, imagine the perception when now you're not in a cruise ship where all these things are allowed. You're being shot at 72 hours by your boss. Every 72 hours, where are you at? Where are you going? I'm going to sit right. He walks in the room, sees someone doing some fancy graphic of, I don't know, uh, you know all the stuff we, we do in design. What the hell is this? I'm paying this guy. He's here. He could be doing my logistical plan. and he's doing. You get what I mean. You need to be cognition of that and have a few tricks. So here they are. Here's the so what according to little Matt. Okay? 
First step, the inquiry. Plan it. So I started by saying, is there planning and design? Hell yeah. For you? You want to facilitate design? You're planning the inquiry. You gotta hit the sweet spot between being out there in space, laying back on your grass, looking at the stars, and you know, you know, your Lawrence of Arabia moment when it's delirious in the desert. That's wonderful. I love it. I can recite it to you uh, uh, quite easily in French, because uh, I read that part in French recently. But that's one spectrum of it. The other spectrum is that you're completely step by step at taking people by the hand and everything. But then they'll generally open their mouth and just wait for you to tell them what to do. And you, of course you defeated the purpose. So you plan. Plan it well, somewhere in the middle of that. Resource it accordingly, obviously. Manage expectation internally, the group you're working in, and externally. And then stick to that narrative of expectation. Stick to it. You gotta be stubborn. If you waver at the pressure, that's like leadership, right? Waving in contact, what happens? You all know this. Same with the design inquiry. You gotta be stable on your feet. And you got strategies when you get caught. I, I had one of these. So I did the design inquiry with, uh, it was one day, it was too ambitious, with a moment piece and security. Uh, so there, um, fellowship. So there were about um, 15 very, very senior women from across the world, colonels and generals, who came to Toronto, and I was trying to do the design inquiry. And it was, uh, I didn't build it exactly like I should have, so I've learned a lot from it, and uh, I distilled that learning in this here today. But essentially, at one point, I'm in front, and I've lost it. And I don't have a bailout strategy, because I never had to have a bailout strategy. Thankfully, there was a wonderful PhD uh, lady, quite experienced, who bailed me out by asking the simple question, what do you ladies think about this? <sighs> Then they just went on to their narratives. And not only did their discussion inform me and help steer me, because they gave me the pathway to getting out of my mud hole, but also it gave me a break to breathe and you know, lower the pressure. So you gotta think about those if it happens, but stick to your narrative is important. Assess the risk. I've given a few of them a good way is to do wargaming of your own scenarios and your own methods. Go through it in your head or with your partner when you do in design. Sometimes I do it with my wife. I ask my super weird, open-ended question to her, and she's extremely rational. And if she looks at me and can't answer anything, I got it wrong. I got it wrong. I got to bring a question that is more in better framed, right? So that's one way. So try it. Part two, we talked about the design heuristics. Um, if it's not playful, you're probably not doing design heuristics because it's engaging. Design heuristics, when you got your crayon on the wall, is about finally, for a guy like me, a bit ADHD, finally having a way to put my thoughts in a structure that actually fit how I think about them. None of them think about a story by a beginning, middle, and an end. That's not how our brain works. Our brain is scattered, but we're used to the patterns of putting it in a linear and structured fashion, and we used to communicate it that way a bit like you know, my, my presentation today. It's kind of a story, right? But this is not our brain thing. That's what design harnesses. So if it's playful, risk go down. Close-mindedness go down. And you really get out there and can shape your understanding, your understanding and your perspectives. But with creativity again. And creativity, I mean, some people maybe are natural. I don't know. Not me. There's mechanisms. By the way, a bit of a rabbit hole. Creativity theory is fascinating because a lot of folks for a lot of time um, I believe that there was eureka moments, that there was aha, to use you know, Oprah Winfrey's uh, famous um, onomatopoeia in French, anyway. It's, uh, it's no such thing. Every time someone looked at creativity, they realized that the eureka moment was the result of that exact spiral we talked earlier. That knowledge that was tacit, that started to be shared, the seed is planted, you go and you eat on it, you sleep on it, you run on it, you come back, it grows, it grows. And all of a sudden, you get a wonderful idea that's creative, it's wonderful, you got there, ha-ha, but it's not a ha. You're not a genius. You work through it in your brain. That's the genius. And design and that empowers you to do that more efficiently. Funny enough, also, is once you've had a creative idea, the second step after it is to think it's not creative at all. I see. Oh, isn't this obvious? In my experience, not science, my experience, Every time a group got to a super creative idea, their second reflex was, what is an obvious? Why didn't we think of that from the start? And to me, that's an indication you've done it right, not wrong. Um, iterate, learning from mistakes, leveraging the wins and emergence. So this is important. 
Experience speaks to it a lot, but you gotta be open to try things, of course. And if you hear someone saying an idea that you don't understand, I bet you half the group doesn't. And they might nod because they just wanna go for lunch. No. Why? You know, you can go to all the techniques you're learning. Why four times? To go back to values a few times, why? But you can also try to reframe the discussion in the afternoon. Hey, you look at that. How about build a systems map around this idea? And if it dies, at least everybody now has a better understanding of that concept, which was there at the beginning. So you've actually won something. You've gained. You haven't lost yet, even though it failed. So that's why the word fail is really misleading. And perhaps the last point, uh, which I've put out there not because I am these things, because I try to be these things, because they're vital to design facilitation. Trust me, it's, uh, some, some of these are a challenge. Showed you a picture earlier, um, and I'll go back. Just a little personal experience. This is a national security program, right? So these are all colonels, international, senior public servant on the left, uh, colonel in the army on the right, that are going to be generals. Most of them are by now. This is last year. And I was asked to facilitate a group to, uh, and Ben was there also, to a complex inquiry. I was a major, right? So I'm a major sitting in a front of a colonel, telling them that their methods of looking at the problem may not be right. Of course, I didn't do that. There's a certain pitfalls in this approach. I tortured myself with this for months. I spent weekends, I was traveling with deputy minister, and I had weekends here and there, trying to war game the hell how this can actually go on. So preparation is useful. And if you're curious, the two things I did that I'm really happy today and I can suggest is I emphasized as I started that everybody has done design. So I call them designer right off the bat. And saying, you've all solved, and it's true, they've all solved complex problems. They all did things like SWAT. They all, they all have those ideas that they've harnessed when they're coming from multiple sources. So we're here, you know this. Let's structure it so that you can reinforce on those good, good habits that you have in your experience to make it even more worthwhile. Killed it. Because all of a sudden, that wasn't a threat that dude or that young, young guy is trying to tell them that they don't know what they're doing. Because of course they do. They were wonderful. And it was an immense pleasure right after that. What I found as a failure, a lot of folks start facilitation with senior groups. Because you'll do that. You'll be the lady or the guy with more senior folks, probably. And they say, well, design exists because we failed in Iraq and Afghanistan. <sighs> wonderful, right? How about starting with a positive objective that is specific, concrete, and speaks Empathy speaks to what people value, right? So building a different narrative is much more useful. And that's a little bit of an experience I went through here. So this is essentially concludes the presentation I wanted to present today. Hopefully it's useful and those metaphors will have you thinking about what design could be. I'm happy to, uh, uh, for any questions you might have. between military and civilian design uh, mindsets, if you will. You touched on that earlier, uh, particularly when you said that uh, if you're building a new product or a new user experience, uh, uh, you might not actually be applying it in the act of violence for a security activity, and thus you're, you're missing some part of it that military design addresses in a different way. I think there's three characteristics in civilian design that are um, slightly different or weighted weight differently. The first one is the importance of data, of data, data, right, of information. So I have a friend who's wonderful who's done a huge design inquiry for a hospital. It took eight months and she had some thousands and thousands of data points. But data points are not, you know, one line in an Excel spreadsheet. They were a series of questioning with certain elements of the hospital to get to understand their structure and how they proceed. She had thousands of them for months at thousands of questions. In the military, very often, unless you're looking at a long-term institutional program, this is not the type of design that we do, certainly not right now. So this is the difference. They really value data for decision-making that a lot of our, of our militaries are just barely getting into for tons of reasons, some of them being information management and information technology-driven, security-driven, but in civilian world, data's power, as you know, and they don't have the same limitation. 
So that's key. They will expect to have more data to lead a design inquiry. The other one is empathy. I, I love the methods of my fellow uh, civilian designers and, and others in the world because they are constantly empathy driven because they need to sell something to make money. Money is their output, right? Money is such a quantifiable, qualifiable concept for them that their alternate state is relatively more clear than us as well. It is, we want to be richer, we want to survive, we want to have market shares. I wish we had that in the military. It never is, much more harder for us. So that's another big one. And, and I guess the three things, right, is that clear output, the, um, the data-driven process, and they value empathy. And I think we benefit a lot from that in leveraging the empathy uh, part especially. Yes, sir. Should the data-driven process in the civilian world have a corresponding intelligence-driven aspect in uh, design, military design? It's a really smart question. I don't think I can answer the should part, but I can characterize what I'm seeing. Um, in my context, right, being a military, not to be specific, intelligence is about interpretation, but the strategic element is about a discourse about a discourse between foreign affairs, defense, politics, policy, legality. And this happens in ways that are emails, pins, meetings, chance encounter in the elevator, people's personalities and values. Therefore, I'd like to say that the intelligence process maybe should be that data, but I think it is an element of that data. And I don't think we can have it as clear cut as the business because again, our strategic objectives are much more fluid. They change all the time. They can change in two seconds, literally, and you got to adjust to it in a way that business doesn't have to. Matt, you talked about human centric design, ADN, SOT. In, I believe in Canada, you have more of an agnostic approach. Do you see, how do you see the future of the design going? You know, is it going to become more agnostic? more hybrid, or what's next in design do you think of from your experience? Because you're able to bounce back and forth between ADN, SOD, human session design. Do you think there's a prevailing one or more of a hybrid coming in the future or something that we need to know? My observation is there an awareness that design heuristics are priceless, they're valuable, and I'm seeing it throughout the military in Canada and all levels. There's an interesting understanding that design can be useful, but we have one huge handicap. Where our big handicap is how accessible design thinking is, unfortunately. At, this, at the risk of you know, being pretentious, if you don't understand some basics of philosophy, that key question I ask at the beginning, the world reveals itself to our method of questioning, you're, you're, you're going to be challenged in your frame of thinking if you don't see that, right? So, social knowledge theory which was actually part of the readings for tomorrow. You know, so social complexity, Berger and Luckman is an essential element. It's opaque as hell, folks. You know, we were talking about earlier because we read that on day, week two of Sam's. Um, it's, it's very difficult to access and to understand this. You need to have a group almost to discuss it, internalize it, challenge it. But it's almost an essential for design. So there's, there's so many things, psychology, military history, because genealogy, understanding where you've been, is important to know where you want to be, that it's not the most super accessible. And I think that's the number one challenge. And that's why I try in presentation to distill the essential of the method. And I think that's why, as an emergence, not on purpose, the Canadian Forces agnostic approach is agnostic, because we don't have the luxury to go cover all methods. And when we bring experts here uh, in Canada, sorry, or certainly in Jay Silent Tap Button in Toronto, the weather should be obvious. But uh, we bring people in to teach these methods, but we expect the students to take the good, the bad, reflect, bad, reflect, and go on their own uh, journey through it. Simply because I guess that's the only way we could achieve that objective, not because we think it's the best way. Yes? So the question is what military problem was solved by design? Um, strong words, solve. Because it assumes, <laughs> yes. Design by itself creates a shared understanding. So I'll, I'll turn you back to Peter Senji's book, The Fifth Discipline. And how you change an organizational culture. 
you know, if you're not going to read all the book, go to page about 30 and you'll have a, a list. And it's actually useful. I don't like lists, but it's actually a useful list of the things you need to do. And three of those five elements are actually coalition of the willing in your culture, shared understanding, and buy-in. There's two more, but don't need them right now. So design, what you're doing now, that group coming together, invariably, by its essence, is creating shared understanding. If those people are from your organization, you brought in the right volunteer stakeholders, preferably volunteers, then you're getting buy-in because it's their idea now. They have skin in the game. They're in it, right? Skin in the game is important. Great new book from Taleb that I recommend you read. Really useful in design as well. And then Coalition of the Willing, well, they go back to organization and they might not be sold on it, which is creative tension. That's good, that's fine. But they'll be sold on some elements of it and then it'll fester. They'll come and they'll have the organization gain from that. So essentially every problem is out by design. Every time design occurred. Now, if that there's been design and key stuff that would sound good to you, um, difficult to say. There's example in Israel plenty. I'll think about it. I do have Sun. We, uh, we have a good version, but I'm trying to think of one that will speak to everybody here. Uh, we had tons of interpersonal policy. So I got one. Um, one of our top general and chief military personnel came up at the uh, level zero, so at the higher echelon, said we, we can't solve the problems of today with the methods we had yesterday, which to me was, yeah, right? So the understanding is design is there. Now capacity is challenged, but in Canadian Forces, capacity is really growing. CJOC is embedded with Canadian Forces College. That's our joint operational, like our global geographic component command, call it that for a US perspective. We got one, it's in Ottawa. It's looking at the I operational, low strategic stuff. They are completely the ones sponsoring the programs with our GCSP design elective and having it move ahead uh, with some of their objectives. And they're seeing the value. So I guess that's a good answer. And I know what they're doing in their law alls with it, uh, but they're certainly bought in uh, and, and finding it useful. Otherwise, they wouldn't come back every year. Okay. Matt, you're many years into your design journey. What's something you wish you knew? If you could go back and do it all again, you would have gotten started earlier doing something. Yeah, <laughs> that's, a, that's a tricky question. Um, well, I'll give you, I'll answer it by giving you advice. Go to the IMDC. I'll, I'll switch that question a bit, okay? I said, what do I think now is the key? Because I was extremely lucky because three things happened for me. I finished graduating from SAMS, I got in my unit, I had spare time, I wanted professional development, I was bored, and I met two individuals, Philippe Bouillou Brassard, Philippe Zufau, and I said, they were doing a conference called the Innovation Methodologies Defense Conference in Ottawa, close to my work, and they said, I want to help. And we built a friendship that has grown since then, and I've been introduced to the network. And that's how I've actually had the opportunities to progressively grow in what I think I can do, right? And then the wonderful opportunities to go and design in Columbia with Alfred Brasher and being here this week uh, with all of you. Um, it kind of grew from that. So I think the key to design journey is to have the exposure and to have the exposure, get connected in the world. And the better way to be connected in the world because it's a relatively small community is the Innovation Methodologies Conference uh, that's happening in March. It's keeping contacts with all of us facilitators and in your country, bringing folks, developing that network. Read a lot. When you don't know something, that's where you need to read, not what you're comfortable. If you like ADM, stop searching ADM, go SOD, right? Things like that. 